Say something. Say hey, something. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about a few things today together. Um, you know, summer's crazy. It's busy. Uh, we were in Texas for a while and uh, together, and then I came home, and then Sue stayed for another week, and now we're back together finally. So it's awesome. And our yard survived, our garden. It's been fun, huh? The strawberries, right? Fabulous. Fabulous strawberries this year. Our neighbors are so kind. They've helped us so much. Great people. Great yeah. people. Great people. So I want to cover a couple things. I know you have a, a few things you want to talk about. Right off the bat, we attended a funeral on Saturday of my, my cousin's husband. So is that a cousin-in-law? He passed away, uh, Roger Cook, in Moroni, Utah. And, it, you know, you're connected to funerals. You go to funerals. Some are close. But this one was something special. Um, the family, every talk was spot on. Every hymn, spot on. The spirit, spot well, tell on. tell them what hymn. What well, was our opening hymn? It was the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Oh, my gosh. It was... It was so great. Roger, <laughs> Vietnam vet, um, businessman, mayor of Moroni, but but just a, a husband and father, a, a, a fantastic, uh, taught them principles, taught them the goodness of the gospel, the simple truths of of service, and it was it was just an amazing experience. The older I get, the more I appreciate um, funerals. I mean, I'll just say it. Um, it. It's a time to really reflect, and it's a time to teach the gospel. And, and the gospel was taught, and the doctrine of Christ was taught in this funeral. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. So a shout out to them, Marianne, my cousin, uh, Roger's wife, she happens to be my cousin as well. And and so I married my, I found my wife at the family reunion. No, uh, it's through, it's all through marriage. So our DNA is okay, right? Our DNA is okay. Yeah. If there's any issues, you know, the kids, our kids can blame us. But now we have, we both have relationship that, that focuses down into Moroni, Utah, which is really kind of cool. You're through the Olsons, Right. And, and then I'm Crosland. My mom was a Crosland. And then Crosland's married, well, Marianne married the cook. So it's just, I don't know. You know how it is, these pioneer families. And it's, it's just a, a great... My father's cousin is Marianne's mother. Your father's cousin is Marianne... Uh, no. My father's, my father's cousin, Helen. Helen. Is Helen is Marianne's mother? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, family mm -hmm. uh, connections, uh, the temple, all of that kind of just fits together, right? And we're just so blessed to be part of the cooks, the. Croslands, the Olsons, we're blessed to be in that, in that group, aren't we? Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I had, I had one uh, uh, listener write and ask about, uh, she has a seven-year-old son that's going to be eight, going to be baptized, and asked if I would just cover a few scriptures and a few thoughts on baptism. And I just, I love this topic. I love this topic. There's so many different ways to approach it. When you talk about the day of Pentecost in, in Acts chapter 2, um, the, the archaeological evidence now points towards the south side of the Temple Mount. In that area, fairly recently excavated, I would say within 12, 15 years and, and currently, Dozens and dozens and dozens of mikvahs or baths, spiritual, you know, baptismal fonts is what we would call them today. And, and you can walk amongst them. 
And this, this would make sense that this is where Peter and the other apostles taught and the spirit came upon them. And then, you know, thousands were baptized there and they would have been there on the day of Pentecost. It was one of the Jewish feasts, the Feast of Weeks, 50 days after Passover. Is that right? And so there would have been thousands of people at the Temple Mount. And this would have been the place where they would have taught and baptized. And you can feel the spirit of it when you're there. We've been there um, a couple of times um, and it's just a, an amazing place. So this, this idea of baptism. Now, I think to really get an understanding of baptism, we, we can start in a lot of different places, but I like to start at section 29. Section 29, lots of stuff in there. But this one, this one is, is why I think baptism becomes so important. This is verse 32. Uh, actually, I'll start in verse 31. For by the power of my spirit created I them, yea, all things, both spiritual and temporal. First, spiritual, and secondly, temporal, which is the beginning of my work. And again, first, temporal, and secondly, spiritual, which is the last of my work. Now let's dissect that a little bit. This, this is my opinion on this scripture, particularly verse 32. We, we think of the creation and we learn a lot of this in the temple. So if you haven't gone to the temple and haven't received your endowment, one of the great blessings of the endowment is understanding this spiritual creation, right? So first spiritually created. And think of the earth and think of us. Okay, we, we are following the pattern of the earth. So first, we're created spiritually or organized, if you want to call it that. And secondly, temperate, temporally or physically. So the, so the earth, all the creations, first spiritually and then physically or temporally, and we're the same. Okay, now that's pretty easy to understand. But then it says, and that's the beginning of his work, of our Heavenly Father's work and His Son, Jesus Christ. And again, first temporal and second spiritual, which is the last of my work. Now that, I think, is where we tie into baptism. Because, okay, so first spiritual, second temporal, the creation, and then temporal again, or physical, that's our physical baptism here on earth. And then second spiritual is our spiritual baptism by fire through the Holy Ghost. See how that works? So, so this is all part of God's creation and his plan. And, and the earth, so think of the earth, it was first spiritually and then temporally created, and then it was physically baptized. A lot of people, there's controversy with that, you know, that the flood was, was regional or this or that. No, it was over the whole earth and it's doctrinally. You know, you can, you can have the, uh, you know, the physical evidence of a universal flood. That's great. But doctrinally, the earth had to be baptized and covered with water. And then it'll be baptized and cleansed by fire at Christ's coming. So that's the pattern of the earth. That's our pattern as well. So the, 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 the baptism by water is critical in that. And so is the baptism by fire. Now, baptism by fire it doesn't come by just the laying on of hands and say, receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, baptism by fire comes through uh, the enduring to the end and, and making and keeping covenants. And, and that baptism by fire uh, comes. And, and sometimes it comes um, fairly quick. We've seen that and we've read that in, in uh, scripture, in the Book of Mormon, when people have received Christ and they're baptized and they clap their hands and the, the joy of the gospel comes and they never depart from that, that's baptism by fire. For the most part, I think it's a lifelong journey and waiting for that baptism of fire of the earth and of ourselves. So that's, that's an awesome thing. And, um, and it's not a one and done. It's not a one and done. So, but baptism by water is very symbolic. So let's, let's get into that. Let's get into the symbolism of baptism by uh, water. 
and talk about it. I like to go to Revelation 22. It's the last book of Revelation. There's so many interesting scriptures. And, and here it is. I'm gonna go uh, Revelation 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. Tree of life is Jesus Christ and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, previously in that chapter, I talked about the city, the new Jerusalem, the, the, the gate, the, and, and this is now talking about the gate to get into that city, right? Okay, what do we call baptism? Rebirth. Rebirth, and we call it the blank ordinance the first the first or the gateway ordinance (laughs) (laughs) obviously we didn't plan this so the gateway ordinance it's the it it gets you into the city so two things happen at baptism um you're well I, i should say more than that but you're baptized and then you're confirmed a member of the church and 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 that gets you in the gate that gets you into the gate baptism gets you into the kingdom, the kingdom of God on earth, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So this is this is the gateway. So let's see what that does for us, this gate, this gate. So I'll start again. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. So in other words, you have right to put the name of the Savior on you. You're taking upon you his name when you're baptized. And the right of the atonement. And the right of the atonement and everything that comes with Jesus. And may enter in through the gates into the city. So the gate, gateway ordinance, baptism. And what's the, what's the city? The city is, is the kingdom of God. Yeah, eternal life. Yeah. And then it says what's on the other side and what baptism protects you from on the other side of the gate. For without, or on the other side, oops, sorry, um, of, of the gate are dogs, not, not nice dogs, but mean ones, and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. This is the world. So baptism gets you into the gate, and that gate is a protection against all this. And, we'll, and, I, and I'll get into that in uh, First Peter here in just a second. I Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star and the spirit and the bride say come. So the Holy Ghost and Jesus say come and let him that heareth say come. For the bride is the church. Excuse me, yeah, the, the Spirit, you're, I'm sorry, yes. So the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and the Bride, the Church, they say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's that living water or the tree of life. Those, those are synonymous. So that's awesome. So let's, let's go to First Peter and um, First Peter, I think it's chapter three. Yes. Yeah. For Christ once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved saved by water. So this this is really, um, well, let's just finish. So verse 21, the like figure where whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answering of the good, a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is, this is so powerful because this is very symbolic of the resurrection, but the eight souls on the ark were saved 
by the water, by the baptism of the earth, because of the destruction of the wicked. If the wicked had remained, everything would have been destroyed. So baptism saved these eight souls. Baptism will save us. It's very symbolic. Now let's go to section 128 because this, this really is an interesting section and in how it describes baptism and the importance of baptism. Um, this is verse 11 in section 128. Now the great and grand secret of the whole matter and the summum bonum. Now you can look that up, but I think it's the greater, the greatest good. The highest good. The highest good. Thank you. The end in itself and containing all good things. So, so this is it. I like to call it the whole enchilada. Okay. So the and the summum bonum of the whole subject that is lying before us consists in obtaining the powers of the holy priesthood, which is. For him to whom these keys are given, there is no difficulty in obtaining a knowledge of the facts in relation to the salvation of the children of men, both as well for the dead as for the living. So here's why the priesthood is, is all important and while the sum and bonum of everything, and here it is. Here in, this is verse 12, is glory and honor and immortality and eternal life the ordinance of baptism by water. Wow, I just got goosebumps. To be immersed therein in order to answer to the likeness of the dead, that one principle might accord with the other, to be immersed in the water and come forth out of the water is in the likeness of the resurrection of the dead and coming forth out of their graves. Hence, this ordinance was instituted to form a relationship with the ordinance of baptism for the dead, being in likeness of the dead. It's almost like the baptism of the dead symbolizing the resurrection and giving life to those people who have passed on through, through their baptism. It's like the baptism for the living is in the likeness of a baptism for the dead. So can I say one thing? Yeah. So when we baptize an eight-year-old, we're not baptizing them because they're sinful. We're baptizing them in the similitude of rising in, as a resurrected being. So you're being dunked, you're being put in the grave, and then you will rise. You will be resurrected. So it's when we say, oh, you're getting baptized to be um, cleansed from your sins. Well, up until the age of eight, you are not held accountable for your sins. So it is actually in likeness of being dead and then being resurrected that they are being baptized. Spot on. And can I say one other? Yeah. One other thing. So in um, DNC 138, um, it talks about that you read in Peter where mm -hmm. Christ went and preached. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, Christ did not go and preach to um, the people who were wicked. It says that he... Um, while this vast multitude waited and conversed, rejoicing in the hour of their deliverance from the chains of death, the Son of God appeared declaring liberty to the captives who had been faithful. So, so in Peter, when it talks about Christ going and preaching to all, he didn't. He only went to the faithful people. And it says, There he preached to them the everlasting gospel, the doctrine of the resurrection and redemption of mankind from the fall, and from individual sins on conditions of repentance. But unto the wicked, he did not go. Mm. Yeah, very good. Awesome. So, so good. Now, every gospel, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, speaks of Christ's baptism, and then right after came the temptations. Isn't that interesting? Uh -huh. His temptation. So, so Christ, now, here's another thing that's interesting with his baptism. Most people feel that he was baptized um, in, the, in the wilderness where John the Baptist would have been. And this is the area um, uh, where the, the River Jordan begins to flow into the Dead Sea. 
So it's fresh water, but it's, it's, it's about to go into to the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on earth. It's like, is it like 1400 feet below, below sea level? Something crazy like that. So here, here's an interesting thing. It, 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 be, everything is for a reason and, and there's a purpose. Everything was prophesied about Christ in the Old Testament of what he would do. When he says he fulfilled all righteousness, he fulfilled every prophecy concerning the Messiah and he fulfilled it. Well, him being baptized at the lowest point is so symbolic. And it's, it's, if you think of baptismal fonts in the temple, where are they? Those fonts are in the basement. They're in the lowest point of the temple. And, and so this is very symbolic of going down, 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 below everybody. So Christ is baptized in the lowest point of the earth. It's also the same site where Joshua brought the children of Israel from into the promised land. Baptism brings us into the promised land, in through the gate, into the, the, the kingdom of our heavenly father. Um, and affords us all those blessings of, of, of um, membership in that kingdom. But so symbolic of, of being buried and coming up. It's the resurrection. It's, 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 it's celebrating the first fruits, which is Jesus Christ. So we, we take upon um, ourselves his name through that act of going down in the grave and coming forth out of the grave in, 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 a, in a, the sense of being baptized. Um, and I love what you said, Sue, about not, it's not necessarily being, your sins aren't being washed away. There's a really funny song. Well, it's not funny, but Randy Travis sings a song about pray for the fish. Oh, it's so good. It's really funny. So this guy's really kind of a character, uh, a lot of sins, I guess. And he gets baptized and because he gets baptized all the sins are washed into the river and then the song is pray for the fish because now they have to deal with all these sins in the water um which is it, it, it's a cool concept now as an adult if you're an adult and you're being baptized and you've had an interesting life let's just say you do become a new creature you're reborn and so in that sense your sins are washed away but an eight-year-old baptism, no. No. So that, that, this is our opinion, right? I mean, I agree with what you said. Well, how could they be, how could they have their They're sins washed away? With, at DNC 68 talks yeah. about it, eight years old. Yeah. Now, I want to, um, if you have another one, go ahead, and then I have one last one. What's your last one? It's section, um, um, it's section 20. Verse 38. Okay, read that, and then I'll tell you if mine has anything to do with that. <laughs> okay. Okay, this... I'm sorry, I'm out of the... Okay. Verse 37, section 20. And again, by way of commandment to the church concerning the manner of baptism, all those who have humbled themselves before God and desire to be baptized and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits and witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end and truly manifest by their works that they have received the spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins shall be received by baptism into the church. Now this is talking about adults being baptized into the church. The church is new. Section 20 is, a, you know, gives us the, the, the uh, baptismal prayer or ordinance. It gives us the uh, uh, sacrament prayers and all kinds of things. So I love that verse. Um, we, we would have our missionaries always um, share that uh, with the convert baptisms. When Sue and I presided over the Salt Lake City West Mission every Saturday, we would spend the bulk of the day going to baptisms, convert baptisms. And every one of them was a miracle. Every one of them had a story. Every one of them was so spirit felt. I, we've shared this before, but one, one uh, young man came out of the waters of baptism and just started clapping. 
he was so excited, wasn't he? And oh, it was incredible. It was so neat. He was older. He was 40. 40-ish. Yeah. Yeah. I say young man, but, you know, oh. just a great, Compared to us, yes. just a great, great young man. And the lady that um, um, introduced him to, to the gospel, if I'm thinking of this right, you might need to help me on this. Uh, she was probably close to 90 years old. Oh, that one. Oh, no, I think he was the one who came out and clapped was the one who was on a hike. He was on a hike. That's right. And, and two return missionaries. missionaries had just returned from their mm. missions and they'd prayed that's in right. the car. That's right. To have an experience teaching somebody about the Book of Mormon. That's right. Thank and, you. Thank you for this other one was a lady in a rest home. And this guy came from back east to uh, he was the Midwest and didn't Midwest. know. He didn't even he'd never heard of. Yeah. A Mormon. <laughs> But he kept passing the church on his walk to work. Where he lived, he passed a, an LDS church, and he, he walked in, uh, to his his job, and he was a nutritionist. He, he prepared the, uh, meals. The, the meals and the menus and uh, to help people. But this lady introduced him to the gospel. And they were similar in age, I think. That's why I might have got him confused, the two. But yeah, so we've seen the glory of... of the, these baptisms. So I hope that's helpful. Why don't you finish up with what you have? Well, <clears throat> this doesn't have anything to do with an eight-year-old, but um, I just want to read this. It's in Moses 6. Because the Adam fell, we are, and by his fall came death, and we are made partakers of misery and woe. And if that is not the truth, behold, Satan hath come among the children of men and tempteth them to worship him, and men have become carnal, sensual, and devilish, and are shut out from the presence of God. But God hath made known unto our fathers that all men must repent. And he called upon our father Adam by his voice, saying, I am God, I made the world, and men before they were in the flesh. And made, so he made men before they were in the flesh. And he also said unto him, If thou wilt turn to me and hearken unto my voice, and believe and repent of all thy transgressions, and be baptized, even in water, in the name of mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth, which is Jesus Christ, the only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come unto the children of men. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, asking all things in his name, and whatsoever you shall ask, it shall be given you. Okay, then it goes on. Um, um, let's see. They taste the bitter, that they may know how to prize the good, and it's given unto them to know good from evil, wherefore they are agents unto themselves. Wherefore, teach it unto your children that all men everywhere must repent. And repent's a, a, pff, repent isn't... Uh, any, uh. <laughs> I have my issues with people saying that they don't need to repent or Heavenly Father loves them just the way they are. Or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God for no unclean thing can dwell there or dwell in his presence. For in the language of Adam, man of holiness is his name, and the only name, and the name of his only begotten is the Son of Man, even Jesus Christ, a righteous judge. Um, I'll just, I'll paraphrase all these. I, Therefore I give unto you a commandment to teach these things freely unto your children, that by reason of transgression cometh a fall, which fall bringeth death, inasmuch as you were born into the world by water and blood and the spirit which I have made. And so became of dust a living soul. Even so, you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water and of the spirit, and be cleansed by blood, even the blood of mine begotten. Mm. Powerful. It's so funny. I was thinking of, of that when you were reading, and I turned to it before you got there because... I think that's the perfect way to end was, was with that scripture. Can I just finish this last part? Blood, water, and spirit, yeah. <sighs> that ye might be sanctified from all sin and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world and eternal life in the world to come, even immortal glory. So why is that so touching? Just going to the temple today being there wondering okay do we say 
Think telestial. Think terrestrial. Or do we say think celestial? We want to be born again. We want to repent of our sins and we want to return to our Heavenly Father and be sanctified, sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. I just think if we think simply, and as our lesson this past Sunday, we talked of things that we have to do. We need to read our scriptures, pray, and fast. And as we do that, we will find truth in the simplicity of the scriptures that are written for us. Beautiful. So, eight-year-olds, you're not sinful. You're entering the gate. But you are entering the gate. And you have the protection of that wonderful city. Can I just tell you quick one story? Mm -hmm. Okay, I read a near-death story. The guy wasn't a Christian. He had an experience. He went and he saw the eternal city. And he it was beautiful. And it was surrounded by four sides, had three gates on each side. And he said, I want to go in there. And the person who was with him, and I can't remember, if, I don't believe, I don't know, if, I don't think it was Christ. Because the person that was leading him said, oh, see that little door right there? He says, that's what you will go into. And he says, let's go. And he says, you can't until you learn all about Christ and follow his commandments and his teachings. And then you can enter into that, into that door. And I thought, isn't that so cool that we have somebody who's seen the eternal city, who sees that they, yeah. straight as the gate and narrows, narrows the, the way. way. That's what I was just going to say. It's, it's not the big wide gate. It's the small, narrow, yeah. Awesome. Okay, I think that's it on baptism. I just wanted to mention one other thing. We're in the middle of the summer. A lot of you are sending missionaries out, either grandsons and daughters or your own sons and daughters. And uh, look, this is just a, kind of a passion of ours. We think about it a lot. We see, we see things happen. But... Um, this is our advice of having presided over a mission, having sent children on missions, and just... Now we have a grandson. Now we, our first grandson's on his mission. Now look, young people, it's, it, missions are tough. It's hard to get used to companions and food and culture and being away from home and all the, all the things, right? It's not about you anymore. And it's, it's not about, about everybody else. Perfect. Well, there can be anxiety, depression, all kinds of things. And that's not bad. You know, sometimes we just need to work through that. Now, look, I'm not going to uh, say that, that medication isn't necessary ever, okay? But let me tell you, <laughs> Mission Medical really bless their hearts bless their heart now see if you say bless their heart you can say anything negative after that our experience and and we've seen a lot of this um that can be pushed like right off the bat i have to tell you i just want to interject please because you handled most of this on our the therapist that was there helping these some of these kids who really had some issues was amazing. Yeah. And he taught the gospel and he prayed with them and he helped them. Um, and it was only, our mission was the, was the one mission who had the lowest amount of missionaries on medications for depression, whatever. I'm, and like you said, there are some cases where you have to be medicated. You have to. You need to be. But I would say it is so easy to get medicated. And, okay, now you continue. Well, and, and quite often, depending on the mission that your your grandson or, or daughter or, or your, your son or daughter are on, uh, they, it might be the first thing they do. Now, look, they're adults, and they really don't 
need to, to share anything with parents and grandparents, especially parents. They don't need to. And here's what I would do. The kids need to grow up and they need to be their own person. But, but I would explain the consequences of getting medicated. There are always consequences. And, and you can't just go off them cold turkey. That's a disaster. They're going to try different medications quite often. And I would try, I would have that as the total last resort. This is just, this is my opinion, but we have some life experience here. And I would, I would, um, you know, you don't need to, to be a jerk and intervene, uh, calling the mission president all the time and all that kind of stuff. But you need to educate your, your, your child, I'll just say that, uh, about being careful to, to not just think, if I just take a pill, everything's going to be fine. It's hard to feel the spirit when you're highly medicated. I, I, I'm just saying, it's hard to feel connected. It, it's not bad to go through anxiety and depression and all those things. It's, it's, it's our little Gethsemane, right? It's our little, it's our little uh, cross that we bear. And, and if we do it and, and work through it and trust in Christ, quite often, quite often, it works out. Now, I know I'm going to get criticism on this. I know there's going to be exceptions. I understand that. But I feel so strong about this. I'm, I'm willing to, to take a hit on it. I don't really care um, because I know that faith in Christ and his atonement does a lot. And working through problems without relying on drugs is, is, is awesome experience. It's an awesome experience. And, and in the cases where that there, there's a, a ba an imbalance or there's some issue, you know, I, I, I'm not a, I, I'm not a professional at that, but I've had a lot of life experience and I would just, I would learn all you can. A diet and exercise are huge in, in helping this as well as well as relying on, uh, you know, our studies and, and just getting out and working, serving, doing. Think of your companion. Take care of him or her. And, and, and do everything for Christ instead of yourself. That solves 99%. And the small percentage to cave everything in for that small percentage and just immediately go... And, and I'll bet you, you're going to have, if you have a son or daughter in that situation, the, the pressure probably is, is to get medicated. And I would caution your son or daughter to, to make that last resort. That's just... But don't freak out because a lot of times they get medication without even notifying you until after. So I hate to say that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's true. true. It's true. Do you, is, what else are you going to say about it? That's it. Okay, well, I want you to finish say something. Up. You finish up. Um, so why I found this article this morning, I was I get up when my dog wakes me up super duper early, and then I pulled my phone out, and I was looking at a few things, and this came up on one of my Facebook feeds, and, and maybe some of you have seen it, but um, it gave a link as to drugs and how they affect our, our brain, and how they help us to not feel God. So it, it dulls our senses so that we do not feel God in our lives. Well, anyway, it starts out about John being on the Isle of Patmos and how he, you know, his revelations there. And he said, um, he talked about our day and how the entire world would be deceived by the sorceries that would come out of Babylon. Well, the, the, he said the deception would be the demise of many good people. Uh, no one would be spared of this great deception by these sorceries. And we all know that the Greek translation of sorcery is pharmakia or drugs. And as we watch TV, um, 
I'll just say TV because I don't I don't ever peruse magazines. But as we watch, um, like even the news, it goes through tons, tons of prescriptions that you can get to make you feel better. And all the people are perky and cute and traveling and have cute clothes on. And, you know, they're not in bed and they're not sick and they're not, you know, out of shape. They're just all these really cool people taking these drugs and look. And then you go, oh my gosh, if I take this drug, then I'll look just like them and I'll be able to do exactly like them. Well... It's TV, people. And anyway, um, it talks about the deaths that occur from prescribed drugs. Um, it's And this was in 1995, a study that had been done, that as many Americans every week died as was lost in 9-11 and from drugs. And if that was in 1995, think of what it is now. I mean, seriously, think of what it is now. And it talks about the deception of antidepressants and how it has homicidal ideation. And it's not just killing somebody, but having a constant thought of killing or how to kill. Um, let's see. There's a, a very long list of school shootings, blah, 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 murder, suicides, people changing sexes, um, teachers doing, you know, something to students and blah, blah, blah. Um, ministers who've done things, straight individuals who become gay, um, sex change surgery. I know, I know. Okay, I'm going to get in trouble because, I, you know, that's... But most of them are on medication. Exactly. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. So I'm just saying... Not everybody that is on a medication will do these erratic things, but um, the you will be in a in the column of having the propensity of, of doing these things. So I'm just saying. Oh, and Elsa talks about um, withdrawal or weaning from these drugs that you have to do it extremely slowly, and you can't can't switch drugs because that's another thing. Um, um, anyway, I, I'm just saying, and you're, I know we'll get people, oh, well, you're so lucky. You haven't ever been depressed. Well, you don't have any idea if I've been depressed or not. You know, just this morning, I was bawling my eyes out about something. And this week, have I just been the pillar of happiness? What did I say on the way home from the temple? I think I'm in the biggest slump I've ever been in my whole life. So I can't. I can't tell you that I've been as depressed as you have, but I can say that I have felt times of great sadness. So I think that we need to be so careful in what we put in our bodies, so careful. And we have to understand what it does to our spirituality and how important it is for us to go back raw and naked to God. And I think that we can do it. I think we can do it. I think that, um, I think we can do it. I know it's hard. I know that a lot of people, you know, oh, you just don't understand how hard this is. Well, I have to tell you, I've been through some hard things. Not where I want to kill myself at all. And I'm always grateful to my Heavenly Father for everything that He has given me. And all that I've learned, I really feel like when you go through hard things, it's very sanctifying. And you become pretty close to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. But I am saying that our spiritual connections can be severed if we partake of these drugs, there's things we can do, you know, there, uh, go out for a walk or watch a funny movie or, and I know you're, uh, I know we're going to hear it. It doesn't solve the problem. I know that. I know it. But maybe watch a, the comedy bar or something, 
you know, there's some pretty funny people that really can take simple things in life and make it funny. But anyway, that's not the point. The point is, is I think that we have to be very, very careful about being deceived and being deceived through Satan with things that are pushed. And I hate to say it, but I believe that um, we might have some pill pushing in Mission Medical. And I love the gospel with all my heart. I'm not apostate. Um, I love Joseph Smith. I believe that um, Jesus Christ is the head of our church. Um, I love my Heavenly Father with all my heart. Um, I know that we can be led spiritually by um, prophets, seers, and revelators. And, but we need to have the Holy Ghost with us so that we can decipher truth from error. And I believe that we've been given that admonition from President Nelson that we need to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost to decipher these things. And we can be led down a really dark path if we are not um, receptive to the Spirit. So. Amen and amen. Thank you. That was that was awesome, powerful. All right, we love you all. Thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Can't wait to hear uh, your thoughts on on this and any other topics. So God bless. God bless. Thank you. Jesus is the Christ. He's our Savior and Redeemer, and we all want to get into that in through that little skinny door to get into the kingdom and so i don't know i guess it all depends on what we want to do if we want to think celestial or think terrestrial or think celestial and there's a difference there is a difference thank you god bless we'll talk to you soon bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.